Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Landmark Chambers uh, and welcome to Property Law Nuts and Bolts Part 1, an introduction to possession claims. Uh, the first in a number of seminar seminars we'll be giving uh, as nuts and bolts. Um, we are delighted to see so many of you here uh, joining us in person um, and online. Apparently, there are 585 of you out there. Um, and we hope that you'll find the presentations uh, and the discussion that will follow uh, useful and informative. Uh, this is the first uh, of a five part webinar and in person uh, seminar series designed to introduce key topics that are likely to crop up for property litigators in their first years of practice. Uh, the talks will provide an overview of the legal and uh, the procedural landscape and hopefully provide you with even more confidence than you already have when you next come to deal with the possession claim. My name is James Hannum, uh, and I will chair the session today. And uh, doing the heavy lifting, uh, I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Miriam Seetler, Brooke Line, and Joel Semakula. Our seminar today is a veritable smorgasbord of delights in the world of possession action. Uh, Joel and Miriam will, will be tackling claims under the Housing Act 1988, and Brooke claims against trespassers. Can I begin, please, with a few boring housekeeping points, which I hope will be um, uh, explain uh, ex will explain to those online uh, what is going on. First of all, unfortunately, there's no video in the room, so if you're online, all you will be able to see when they come on uh, to the screen are the slides and hopefully uh, the speaker speaking to them. Uh, those of you at home, your microphones are automatically muted, so you don't need to adjust any of your settings. Uh, secondly, we would welcome questions online uh, posted throughout the session, and please submit those via the Q&A button, which you find at either the top or the bottom of your screen. Um, thirdly, we'll endeavor to answer those questions, I think, at the end. Um, uh, of all three presentations rather than doing it after each one. Uh, fourthly, the seminar will be recorded and you'll receive a link to both the presentation, i.e. the slides, uh, and the recording shortly after the event concludes. So there's no need uh, to scribble copious notes if you don't wish to. Um, and lastly, if, again, if you're online, your connection is lost at any point during the seminar, uh, we invite you to rejoin the meeting by clicking on the original link once more. Uh, now with that, let's get cracking uh, with possession claims. Uh, and the first uh, presentation is going to be given by uh, Joel Semakula, who's talking about claims following the services section eight notice. Uh, briefly, Joel successfully completed uh, a specialist property pupillage uh, at Landmark a couple of years ago, and he's now building an extremely successful practice in all three of Chambers practice areas, but with a particular focus on property. Uh, he's a regular advisor to both tenants and landlords, both commercial and residential, and has appeared in a range of, of tribunals during the period he's been practicing. Uh, most recently, he's been involved in the Interstate Britain and the Just Stop Oil litigation, uh, acting on behalf of national highways and major energy companies. Uh, and like many of our property juniors, he regularly appears in county courts up and down the, count the country on all types of possession claims, including proceedings brought pursuant to Section 8 of the Housing Act. So with that introduction, over to Joel. Thank you very much, James. For the benefit of those at home, um, I look very similar to the picture you see on the screen at the moment, save for I'm wearing a red tie and green socks. Uh, not a choice everyone would have made, but uh, here we are. Um, so moving on to uh, section eight. So here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, it's going to be a we've only got 20 minutes, so I wish to stop two or through um, uh, the, the act. Uh, looking at everything from the grounds, taking us through the whole process of uh, getting to an order uh, and hopefully including some tips uh, and tricks, uh, particularly for those of us who travel up and down doing these around the country. So uh, section five uh, of the Housing Act is the primary section which confers a security of tenure on an insured tenant. Uh, the security opter operates by the fundamental proposition that the tenancy cannot be brought to an end by the landlord except by his serving a notice seeking possession 
and obtaining an order of the county court. Uh, remember, the key word here is the landlord. It does not prevent termination by the tenant. Uh, now, where a fixed term tenancy is involved, that means where we're not dealing with a periodic tenancy, the landlord can still exercise a contractual right to termination if such a right is contained within the contract. And on the notice point, something to come back to is that the notice requirement can, of course, be waived by a court if the court considers it just and equitable to do so. And that's something I'll come on to a little bit later. Now, where an order uh, for the, of the court for possession of the of the residential property is obtained, the tenancy end when the end ends when the order is executed. So, what does that mean? What it means, except where a court makes an order for possession, following a notice seeking possession, a periodic tenancy automatically arises, as it does when a fixed tenancy expires uh, by a fluxion of time. So what this means is the tenant retains the right to remain in possession, depending on a periodic tenancy arising by virtue of this section. My goal today is to take you on a journey to a possession order pursuant to section eight, so uh, buckle up. We'll start here. Can anyone tell me where that is? Oval, 10 points to Gryffindor. Um, so let's talk grounds. That's oval cricket grounds, best I can do. Um, now, once, the court is satisfied of the substance of the claim for a possession. And what I mean by that is that the court's happy that all the technical requirements have been met. The next step is for it to be satisfied a ground for possession is made out, and that's in section seven. If this cannot be established, then naturally the proceedings must inevitably be dismissed. The burden's on the landlord uh, throughout to show that the ground is made out on the balance of probabilities. Uh, and those, the grounds of possession are set out in Schedule 2 of the Act, uh, and these fall into two groups. Uh, the first set are the mandatory grounds. So if the landlord proves that any of them applies, the court is bound to make the order sought. Now, I don't have time to take you through each of these grounds today, but I'm gonna spend a little bit, bit more time talking about ground dates, because that's the one we see come up um, very often. The second set of grounds for possession are the discretionary grounds. So this requires that the landlord prove not only that one such ground applies, but also that it's reasonable for an order of possession to be made out. And I'll be coming onto the practical implications of relying on a mandatory rather than a discretionary ground shortly. Now back to ground eight. Ground eight requires rents to be due both at the date of service of the notice and at the date of the hearing. So the purpose of this ground is to deal with the situation of uh, serious renderies. Uh, the position is where the tenants failed to pay more than eight weeks rent in the case of weekly payments, two months in the case of monthly payments, one quarter in the case of quarterly payments, or three months are due in the case of annual payments. So if you're dealing with a ground eight claim, what, what's something you might want to think about? The first is when claiming possession on this ground, it's advisable to cite more than one ground. Since if the tenant pays off part of the arrears shortly before the hearing, this ground can no longer be proved and possession proceedings will have to be abandoned. It's therefore common practice to cite uh, ground eight alongside usually grounds 10 and 11, um, if they're applicable, and also to wait at least until at least two months rent um, are due, or at least eight weeks, um, where we have a weekly tenancy. Second point I want us to think about is that often when faced with a ground eight possession claim, tenants will raise potential arguments related to a potential counterclaim, perhaps disrepair, uh, failure to send rent deposit, and they may argue that they should be allowed entitled to set off those amounts uh, against the rent you're saying uh, is in arrears. At this point, it's important to consider whether the tenancy agreement itself has some kind of set-off clause, whether that's actually permitted. And if you've got an appropriate set-off clause that prevents that from occurring, then, then you, when you get to your hearing, you obviously be, on, be relying on that, you should be relying on that clause to 
say that um, the rent remains we can, we're entitled to our possession order today, or we'll move forward with directions for your counting claim. I'm going to come back to section 48 a little bit later. As I mentioned, it's always important here to consider the potential counting claims, uh, uh, which may uh, affect your rights to an order. And the final point I want to raise is something that was a real problem before the pandemic. Uh, but it's, it's something that, that we often deal with as council. Uh, uh, particularly if nobody wants, not many people, not as many people want to come up to court in person. Um, we've had a number of a number of us have dealt with situations where clients, the client wants possession on ground eight, but doesn't want to send al along anyone to court apart from council. And the problem there is that someone needs to give evidence to confirm the arrears at the date of the hearing, uh, and council cannot give evidence. So you end up with a situation where uh, um, this often will give you the up-to-date rent arrears schedule, and some, some judges are happy to accept that. Uh, but strictly speaking, you're really at risk of not getting uh, because you can't establish the date, uh, the amount of the arrears at the date of the hearing. So the big tip there is to send someone along who can actually give that evidence. So I started about the practical consequences here. Um, We're looking at section nine. So if, if you rely on a discretionary ground, it's important to know that section nine of the act gives the court the powers to adjourn, stay, suspend, or postpone possession uh, when, this, uh, when these grounds are applicable. Uh, that's really important probably for your client for determining when, if the client's a landlord, when they'll actually get um, the property back. So uh, uh, that, that, that's um, a real practical consequence that we think about when deciding uh, the grounds. Uh, one point to note is, I just want to bring up section seven and six, is the way you have an assured tenancy uh, uh, and it's fixed term and it has not yet expired or been determined, only some of the grounds are actually available uh, to the landlord. Uh, uh, so in those circumstances, you can still serve a notice of, of, of possession. You can only rely on grounds two, seven A, seven B, eight, or ten to fifteen. I don't. We don't have, obviously need to remember them. I'll show those up very shortly in terms of what they are. But the point here is just simply there are limited grounds that you can rely on if the tenancy um, is yet to be uh, determined. Uh, but it's also important that the terms of the tenancy have to allow you to rely on one of those grounds. So you've got to look quite closely at what the agreement says. If you're still with me, we're moving on to the next step of our journey, notices. So if we go to section eight, uh, section eight says that a notice of seeking possession must be served before the court can entertain proceedings. Like I said, save where the court waives that requirement. And the notice must, and it's listed there on the, on the slide, it must contain specify the ground on which possession is sought. Um, although these may be altered or added to with the leave of the court. It, it must provide the date uh, before which proceedings cannot uh, begin. And it states the date, uh, the, the final stop date after which proceedings uh, um, may be issued. A key point to look at is the notice must still be in force at the time the proceedings are commenced. And that relates to um, the third The court, the ground, um, section A also allows, like I said, allows the court to weigh or alter or add to the grounds, but this cannot be done in three circumstances. Where we're dealing with 7A, which is antisocial behavior, 7B, where you're alleging an individual has no right to rent, and um, uh, ground A, so that's serious rental. Section 9 I've set out here the timings for the service of notice proceedings, and you're going to get these slides. And, uh, you can find this all very, very easy online. The only, the only point I want to, to, to make here is that uh, you may all remember practice direction 55, uh, 55C and some of the changes that occurred with that during COVID, but also um, the changes that occurred to notice uh, periods. Now, we've gone back now to the uh, pre coronavirus act position, but if you're dealing with a possession, uh, a Section 8 claim, 
that was an issue some time ago, maybe it was like slightly difficult to open it, it was that some uh, to consider. Uh, and going back to ground date, the relevant notice period here is two weeks. Well, that could have gone badly. Then I've got here the, uh, the notice periods here where, we, where we're dealing with uh, discretionary grounds. Again, we're dealing with uh, two weeks for grounds 10 and 11, and two weeks for the other discretionary grounds, uh, the 12 to 15 and 17. I promise to come back to section 48 for something you may want to consider. Uh, now section 48 requires the landlord of residential premises to notify the tenant of an address of service in England and Wales. This can, can sometimes be a kicker. Uh, uh, it, failure to do so renders any rent or service or administration charge otherwise due irreco irrecoverable until the landlord complies with the section. So crucially, the landlord cannot use the failure to pay such sums as a basis for possession proceedings, since the sum is deemed not due for all purposes. Moving on now, so we've dealt with the grounds, dealt with the notice, well, how do we actually issue the claim? Part 55 sets out the procedure to be used uh, where the claim included, where the claim includes a possession or by man. Such as uh, Section Eight and Rule Fourteen, you can hear about Section Twenty One, and, I've, and uh, of course claims against trespassers. And I've set out some of the basics of what's required here on the slide. If we're looking at the claim form, Practice Direction Fifty Five A Point Two Point One sets out what's required in the claim form, and you see there it says it must state. Uh, the ground, sorry, what's required in the particulars of claim. They must state uh, the ground, including the statutory ground, if, if applicable. Remember, we said it needs to be in the notice and we need to see in the particulars of claim. And you do have judges who, if it's not everywhere where it needs to be, will not give you your possession. A worrying day for all of us, perhaps. If we're dealing with, a, with the particulars of claim for a ground A, uh, ground a or um, indeed grounds 10 and 11, uh, practice direction 54 power 2.3 here sets out what's required uh, in those circumstances. And uh, on the slide there, you can see what the particulars of claim must include. Uh, generally, generally, I say to everyone, if you, if you do go to court, bring your calculator with you if you do know who the renter is. Uh, I think from the council's perspective, you, it, when you provide that rent schedule, it's really helpful if you provide a a column at the end where, where you've got cumulative total as we're going along as to when amounts become due um, makes life a bit easier in the hearing. Again, looking at part 55, the usual position is that possession claim should normally be issued in the county court. You, you'll see there uh, uh, CPR part 55.5, which deals with issues related to the hearing dates. And it will come of no surprise to everyone that we're currently dealing with substantial delays in the county courts and actually getting uh, uh, um, these claims heard. So some of the estimates that we used to give us were going to give us um, uh, or to seek advice in respect of which court we're trying to, to, to get heard and see what, what things look like in that particular court. Now, where an order for possession is granted pursuant to mandatory ground, the ground should be stated on the face of the order, uh, especially where, and this is, uh, and this is exactly what I advised earlier, where the landlord's notice seeking possession relies on both mandatory and discretionary grounds. And if dealing with a money judgment, which, uh, and say if you're dealing with a ground they claim, you'd often expect uh, to get judgment for your arrears, uh, you've got to set out the amount, um, the interest, and the rent at a day rate. Of course, the end of the hearing, can't forget the issue of costs. In general, and with the important exception of mortgage possession claims, the usual rules about costs in the CPR apply. So uh, if you're going to be seeking costs, you need to file a statement of costs uh, 24 hours, 24 hours before the hearing. Uh, and the starting point is, of course, uh, the, the rule in CPR uh, 44.2, uh, that the unsuccessful party will be able to pay the costs of the successful party. 
uh, where you have contractual costs, uh, uh, the court uh, may order the costs under the terms of the contract. Uh, well, unless the uh, even where those costs would not ordinarily be recoverable, uh, okay. uh, and in such cases, the court should apply the expectations. The court will apply the terms of the contract subject to its uh, equitable power to disallow unreasonable expenses. Uh, the final point, it's really important. Important clients are warned of this. Uh, if we're in a fixed costs regime. There are certain claims, and you see that, that uh, certain possession cases where fixed costs apply, um, and uh, and that's where you may end up with one of those categories on the slide. Uh, often, uh, uh, your your clients will get a possession order and, and, and assume if they've got it, uh, it means they're getting their residential property back. That day, or even within 14 days, and I think even if it, uh, you get possession on mandatory ground, I think it's important to remind people of section 89. This is where the court makes an order for possession, it, it, it cannot postpone the date for giving possession for more than 14 days unless possession by that date would cause exceptional hardship, uh, in which case you can get a postponement, uh, which is up uh, for up to six weeks, or the landlord consents in the preamble uh, to enforce. Uh, in the preamble to the order uh, for some kind of specified period. Now, the court's got no power to suspend a possession order or the execution of it uh, beyond those periods unless the landlord consents. And there's a particular issue that I've, I've dealt with where you've got mandatory grounds and the period, six week period is well and truly gone. But, um, uh, somehow, somebody has noticed, yeah, without notice here, uh, and get suspension of that. And that's to deal with that problem. Uh, but, but the court does not have that power. I think the practical point here, just because you get uh, possession on the mandatory ground, it doesn't mean you get possession. Final point uh, relates to, to uh, an issue here we, we often have is defendants do not often attend possession proceedings. Uh, whatever, just because you have an order doesn't mean that's necessarily the end. Because once an order is made, uh, we've got CPR 39.3, uh, which allows a party to set aside an order where they didn't uh, attend court in certain circumstances. So you may want to, you want to be aware of that particular risk uh, once you've secured your possession order. And I will hand over to Miriam. I'll hand over to James. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Joel. It was um, extremely interesting and enlightening. Um, I remember dimly being sent out to do um, possession claims in the county court. And there were some judges, um, and doubtless you will have come across them too, although there are fewer now, who would delight uh, in having a Tuesday or Thursday list in which they had junior counsel in front of them, uh, pursuing either rent tax uh, or housing out possession claims. And it was uh, always a nightmare. And one was sent home with your tail between your legs because you've forgotten a relevant document. So usually, the, uh, usually the office copy entry uh, originally certified, um, which uh, underwrote your uh, your claim for possession as the um, owner of the reversionary interest. Um, in any event, um, you, and you couldn't get past that. I'm glad to hear that at least judges are accepting, um, without the benefit of a witness, uh, the uh, the existence of rent arrears. That is a step forward. Um, but in any event, we're reminded, aren't we, this, um, that these claims are a minefield. And I think that's no less true of the um, next topic, which is, again, a housing act possession claims um, following the service for session 21 notice. And Miriam's going to address uh, this subject. Uh, Miriam is a uh, 2015 call. Um, happily, she had cause to be on maternity uh, leave for most of last year, but she's now back in the, the rough and tumble of major property litigation. Uh, and she has had, I know, plenty of experience of um, these sorts of possession claims, uh, taking them from first hearings to trial. And she is um, also uh, the editor I think the editor, rather than one of the editors, of the residential possession section of Hill and Redden. So I'm sure this will be extremely enlightening. Miriam, thank you. James, um, for those online, I did once look like that, but since that photograph was taken, I have had twin boys. And also, my eyebrows have been through a pandemic and a series of lockdowns, so I don't quite look like that photo, but I'm glad that people online are seeing that uh, rather than anything else. Sorry for those who are in attendance. 
And uh, there's two things that people want from a talk, I think. One is a checklist. What do I do next? Um, ideally, a 10-point checklist. And secondly, a quiz. And I have sought to provide uh, both of those things today in my uh, short talk. So firstly, the basics. What is Section 21? Um, if you don't know, it's the procedure by which a landlord tries to get out a residential tenant without, uh, usually with two months notice and without having to prove any fault on the part of the tenant. So it's often referred to as a no-fault eviction. Um, and it's often considered, or was once considered, the easiest way to get rid of a residential tenant. You've just got to serve the notice and not mess up anything else. Will Section 21 be around for much longer? Why do I ask that question? Um, the government has for a long time planned to abolish what's called no fault eviction, so Section 21. Um, this promise has been repeated in recent white papers and also in the Queen's speech, and it's been promised that there will be a rent of reform bill in the next parliamentary session uh, abolishing Section 21. So this could become completely um, irrelevant to the content of this talk, and this may be the very last time that anyone in Landmark gives a talk on Section 21. So really a privilege. <laughs> okay, my first promise to give you a 10 point checklist. So if you have a, if, if you have advised your client to um, pursue a section 21 claim as landlord, or if you are acting for a tenant and you're trying to find something that the landlord tripped up on, this is a 10 point checklist. You go through this checklist and consider have all these steps been carried out. Okay, so step one on the checklist, look at the nature of the tenancy. What you need to be looking at is when the tenancy started, was it for a fixed term? That's the most usual. So a grant of a, of a short of a, a short shot on tenancy for a year, something like that. Or is it a contractual periodic tenancy? Much more unusual, uh, quite rarely seen these days, um, where it's just a rolling uh, weekly or monthly and there's no, when the tenancy is granted, there's no um, specification of the length of the term. It's just a contractual periodic. Why is this relevant? Technically, you would be bringing a section, depending on which one of those it is, um, you're bringing a claim under either section 21.1 or 21.4. What's the practical relevance of that distinction? Really only one thing, um, and that's the point up on the screen, which is that if it's a contractual periodic, it's not just a matter of giving two months notice. You need to make sure that the date that you're giving in the notice is not earlier than the earliest date of the tenancy could be brought to an end by notice to quit given on the date of the section 21 notice. So to translate that, um, if you have a contractual periodic tenancy, which is quarterly, it's not as simple as just giving two months notice. You have to think on the date that you're serving the notice. If I were to, if this was a um, just a quarterly tenancy and I was serving a notice to quit to terminate it, what date would I have to put in that notice to quit? Um, and therefore the notice, the date you put in the section 21 notice, you've got to be asked about. This doesn't arise very often. Just make sure you know what tenancy you're dealing with. Okay, step two, the stage of the tenancy. This is important and is often overlooked. Assume that you're dealing with a fixed term. You need to be very clear whether we're in the middle of the fixed term, which for a section eight um, claim might be quite common that you're terminating the tenancy within the fixed term. For section 21, it's not, it's much less common. So establish are you within the fixed term or has the fixed term ended? Um, if the first case of, of trying to serve a Section 21 notice which expires during the fixed term, that will only work if you've got a break clause in the tenancy agreement and you effectively uh, exercise that break clause. Second scenario, serving your notice during the fixed term, but one that expires after the fixed term, that's absolutely fine. There's no problem with that. And, and then there's obviously the, the third scenario, which is not fair, which is that the fixed term is completely finished. A statutory periodic tenancy has arisen, um, and obviously you can serve your notice then to expire in at least two months. Uh, so try to make that distinction between whether you're in the fixed term or not. The third point, timing. There's three quite boring rules about timing, but um, don't trip up on these because they're they're basic. Um, they are you can't have a possession order taking effect earlier than six months from the date of the grant of the original tenancy. You can't give notice within four months of when the original tenancy began, um, and you've got to issue within six months from when the notice is given. So that last point sort of puts a shelf life on the life of your Section 21 notice. You can't just leave it there hanging over the tenant um, 
taken and worried. And um, there are some exceptions for the pandemic period where that period was that six month period lengthened, um, make the whole sort of new time scheme work. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of that because we're not likely going to be using those notices that much anymore, but there are extensions there. And there's also extensions for if you're trying to terminate a contractual period, there's a different time there. The length of the notice, point four, generally it will be two months and you've got to give a minimum of two months. That doesn't mean that you've got to give two months. Um, and I would certainly advise giving yourself a bit of leeway because the two months needs to run from when the um, tenant receives the notice, uh, not when you send the notice. So definitely give yourself leeway there. There shouldn't be only two months between the date and the notice, as in the date you serve, the, the date that you actually sign the notice and the date that you say the notice expires. That would be too tight. The first exception to the two month rule is the COVID period. I'm not going to go through that in detail, but basically over various periods during the pandemic, the length of the Section 21 notice was increased from two months to three months to six months down to four months. Now it's back to two months. So you do need to be aware if you are dealing with a notice that was served during that period, um, just make sure that the length of the notice is the correct, um, is, is higher than the minimum. And the second exception is the one I mentioned before, section 21.4, which is when we're dealing with a contractual period extension. As I said, you've got to be quite careful about that, that date. Um, although it doesn't state it in the Act itself, you can't start proceeding until the notice is expired. Point five, the form of the notice. You can't go that wrong with this because there's a prescribed form. All I would say is don't use the prescribed form that you downloaded four years ago on your computer. They do change the form quite often and you just don't want to be tripped up on that. So I would suggest every time you send a new notice, you might as well download the, the free form again uh, to make sure you're using the most up-to-date one. Errors in the notice. This is quite a frequently arising issue. Um, and the good news is you can actually get it quite wrong without um, messing up the claim. Um, there was a recent Court of Appeal decision on this uh, called Keys and Carter, where the, it was actually a Section 8 case, but the same this is going to apply to these notices, especially under the Housing Act. Um, they basically put the wrong, they said the notice expires on November um, 2017, but they actually meant 2018. Um, it's quite a bad error because by November you should really know what year it is. Um, but basically the court said that that was valid, um, but the, that that was fine and upheld that notice. So that is quite reassuring. But what the case is actually most useful for is a brilliant paragraph which summarizes the approach the court should take to you know, how wrong is how wrong is wrong. Um, and it's basically a two stage test. The first stage is the application of the Manai test, which you might be familiar with. So asking what would a, how would a reasonable recipient interpret this notice? So ask, would a reasonable recipient appreciate that an error had been made and also appreciate what meaning was intended to be conveyed? So that's the first stage. And then the second stage is if, if that's the interpretation, um, applying that interpretation that the reasonable recipient would have, does that um, interpretation of the notice comply with the statutory requirements? Because especially when you've got a prescribed form, it, you've got to be quite careful that you actually are complying with the statutory requirements imposed by the regulations so um, and even if it's not exactly what the statute requires is the form substantially to the same effect as what is required so if that was all a blur to you i would just suggest looking up that paragraph 39 it's a really good summary actually generally in wider communication um, what to do when you've messed up the prescribed form for the incorrect date but i think the general message is you could probably go a bit more wrong um, than you think you might, but it's a bit ideal if you use those. Also, we've got to go to court and argue these points. So, from my perspective, if you just get the notice right, that's a lot better. Um, okay, prescribed legal requirements, stage six. This is the, um, the someone raised their hand at that comment. Um, okay, prescribed legal requirements. This is all the extra regulation that the Deregulation Act um, imposed, um, which is which is really the main respect in which section 21 has now become a lot more heavy and actually a lot more difficult than just going down the section 8 and trying to prove those rent arrears. There's quite a lot of additional stuff that landlords can trip up on. 
The good news is this only applies to tenancies granted on or after the 1st of October 2015. So that's quite good news. Uh, what do you have to do? You have to provide an energy performance certificate, you have to provide a gas safety certificate, and you have to provide how to rent your clerk. When do these uh, steps have to be taken? They just have to be taken at any time before you serve the section 31. There was some concern, and then some case law on does that with the gas safety certificate, does it shouldn't that have to be provided at the beginning of the tenancy, i.e., before the tenancy is its occupation? The Court of Appeal has dealt with that issue, and the position is as you see it on the screen. So, lots of landlords actually, to protect themselves, serve all of these documents just before. Uh, lots of people serve at the beginning of the tenancy. Um, if there's uncertainty as to whether it's served at the beginning of the tenancy, uh, landlords have the habit of serving all these documents again. Uh, sort of a week before Section 21 notice, just to be uh, careful. One point on the house rent book that that also is updated um, sometimes. So it is worth checking that you're using the correct house rent and if the, any estate agent is working with your client with regards to landlords, that they're using the up to date one. Deposit this was also um, adds quite a level of complexity. There's various things that the landlord has to do if they receive a deposit from the tenant. Um, if you mess up as landlord, then you're on the hook for penalty. Not only that, if you don't return the deposit, that could restrict you from serving a valid section 21 notice. So firstly, what does the landlord have to do when they get a deposit? Two things. They've got to protect it in the tenancy deposit scheme and comply with the initial requirements of that scheme. And they've got quite a strict time limit to do that within 30 days of receipt. They've also got to give the tenant prescribed information again within 30 days of receipt of the deposit. So if they fail to do that, no matter what steps they take next, there's potentially a financial penalty against them. Um, what does this have to do with Section 21? Well, if you fail to do any of these things, then potentially if you do not return the deposit, then um, you will be prevented from serving Section 21 notice. There's one quite significant exception in. Um, Section 215B, um, which helps landlords in a situation where, um, in a quite common situation where there's an original tenancy, but then a replacement tenancy or series of replacement tenancies, uh, which is actually quite common. A replacement tenancy being tenancy of the same premises or substantially the same premises, same landlord and the same tenant. And it backs, it's sort of back to back with the original tenancy. In that situation, if you've complied with the deposit requirements, uh, late, but by the time the replacement tenancy arises, you have complied, uh, then you don't have to return the deposit to your tenancy deposit um, in order to be able to serve a valid section 21. We look out for deposits. The rules are actually quite a lot more complicated than that. That's trying to be a summary. Licensing, this can also uh, trip landlords up. There's quite complex and extensive licensing laws now, mandatory additional and selective licensing. It doesn't just affect um, HMOs, which is what, what mandatory and additional licensing, um, but there's also various um, additional licensing apart from HMOs. The point is you can't serve a section 31 notice if a property is required to be licensed and it's not licensed. Uh, and there's two exceptions there up on the screen. The most significant one is that if you've made an application for a license and you just haven't heard back, that's um, then, you're, then you're exempt. So that's probably the most significant option. And the most recent level of complexity added to Section 21 is the Tenant Fees Act 2019. And here the point is that if the landlord is in breach of the Tenant Fees Act 2019 by taking what's referred to as prohibited payments and not returning them, uh, then um, they've got to return that, uh, that payment before they can serve Section 21 notice. The Tenant Fees Act is actually quite complicated and difficult to read. Uh, I would suggest looking at the guidance. There's a government online guidance there, which helps to some extent in explaining what's going on. It does help in setting out what are permitted payments. So you can see on the screen those various permitted payments. And if a landlord is receiving, um, for example, deposits in excess of what's permitted and not returning them before serving a Section 21 notice, then that Section 21 notice will be uh, invalid. In my experience, um, over the past few years, this, since this act came into force, this is the most common thing that landlords are tripping up on. It's not really on their radars. Um, and also, I would say that agents, although they're very much aware of it, um, 
I don't blame them for it. They don't necessarily have the fullest understanding of all intricacies of the act. So uh, this is quite a common thing to trip up on. And then finally, retaliatory eviction. This is very underused in my experience. Um, the idea is that if the landlord is trying to evict a tenant in response to complaints that the tenant has made about disrepair or um, human habitation issues, uh, that shouldn't be allowed. So there's two routes by which a tenant can uh, prove this, that the landlord is trying to use section 21 in response. Either the tenant has got to plead with the local authority to get them to serve an improvement notice um, or notice of emergency remedial action. Um, and if they do that, then there's a six month moratorium when the landlord cannot serve section 21. Or there's another much more convoluted process which involves a large amount of correspondence between parties. Um, and then the local authority still has to take action. In my experience, tenants aren't writing to the local authorities to trigger this. And if they are, the local authorities aren't acting on their bodies, aren't acting quickly enough. So it's, it's worth a try if that's the issue that you've got um, in your case where there's a serious disrepair issue and the landlord is looking like the landlord is going to respond to that by serving notice, then it is worth um, doing this. Um, obviously, pick an option depending on whether a section 51 notice. Um, yeah, depending on the, the timing is quite is quite crucial because the first imposes a moratorium um, and the second it, it requires the section 21 notice to come at quite a specific point. Okay, so that's your checklist, that's 10 points. You should get these slides uh, and then you should be able to use it, you know, to tick off. Obviously, each of these topics is quite um, detailed and complex. Um, but at least you know you're looking at each, each of the issues and then if you've got an issue on a particular one of those, um, then you can obviously instruct council. Okay, let's go to the quiz, which is the best bit. Um, people are online can engage on the Zoom poll, but people in the room, they're going to have to raise their hands. So, Josh, can we go to the slides, the, the, the poll? Yeah, okay. Oh, there's loads up there. Okay, the first one. Can you read that? The court has the power to dispense the service of section 21 notice if it considers it just in all the circumstances of the case. True or false? Okay, true. Put your hand up if you think that's true. And false? Can people online... Can we see how they're... Okay, I'm just going to. Okay, I'm just going to reveal that I think the majority in the room had that right, which is the false. That is true in the case of a section twenty-eight, a section eight notice. In the case of a section twenty-one notice, there's no power to dispense. All of them are tricky like this. Okay, number two. If there are two landlords, both of those landlords must serve the section twenty-one notice. It's not sufficient for just one landlord to go ahead and do it himself or herself. True or false? So true. Both landlords have to serve. True? <laughs> and false. Only one landlord has to serve. Okay? Can we not get answers on the screen? Okay, fine. We're just thinking all the online people. They can just think about it. Okay, the position is false. If there are two landlords, only one of them has to serve. Okay, the third question. This is tricky. What would be the notice period for a Section 21 notice which was served in October 2020? So that's like post the first lockdown, but still pretty miserable. We were supposed to have a lockdown then. It's half term. Can we go, Josh? Can we go down to see the next question? Okay, there's <laughs> Josh. Oh, oh, I'm in control. <laughs> Oh, some people are just completing the whole questionnaire. No, 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 it's not that kind of quiz. We're doing it one by one here. Okay, let's just stick with this question. Okay, so everyone knows it's not two months because that's the standard period. So between six months and eight months, six months and eight months. Yeah, six months is correct. Okay, this is so rubbish because they've really... <laughs> Okay, would that notice still be valid if I issued proceedings now? So that notice is getting on to two years old. Would that be valid? No, everyone's saying no. Correct. 
for a seven people completely okay let's go with five the two months notice so that's just the standard two months notice on any section 21 notice one from the date which is written on the notice i.e the date that the notice was signed no someone want to tell me why yeah exactly so that's why i said try and give yourself some leeway um the notice yeah so the notice incorrectly states that it expires on november 2021 rather than 2022 is it valid so i'm giving two months notice let's say i'm serving notice today and i say it expires on the 28th of november 2021 obviously that's date in the past is it valid yeah it's likely it is valid on the basis of that court of appeal case keys and carter that the reasonable recipient would would realize though that's obviously the wrong day obviously they meant 2022 which is sufficient notice okay number seven the notice is signed by the landlord's agent. This is difficult. And gives the agent's address, not the landlord's address. Is it valid? So anyone who thinks that, so this is a notice. I think it says, it's a good question. This is what the case is about. This is based on an actual case called Krempe and um, Bacani, the court of appeal case. And it was based on what does the prescribed form actually require. The prescribed form is slightly confusing in that it says things like, you know, it says like landlord's agent, landlord's agent address, landlord's name, landlord's address. So it's a bit unclear as to who's supposed to be, do you have to fill in all those gaps or not? The Court of Appeal actually held that if the landlord's agent is signing, in this case the solicitor, then it's the landlord's agent address that needs to be there. And the landlord's address itself doesn't have to fit anywhere on the form. Again, this was a section eight notice, just so you know. Um, which of these necessarily prevents service of a section 21 notice? This is a question about um, the Tenant Fees Act, which nobody really understands as much about. Which of these necessarily prevents service of a section 21 notice? Yeah, the online people have got it right. Receipt of a non refundable holding deposit. Why is that? Um, you can have a permitted payment, which is a refundable holding deposit. What are that supposed to be? I'm not sure. Um, these are all permissible. This is a level of deposit which is not problematic. Um, and also, the, the um, restriction on serving section 21 only applies if a prohibited payment is taken by a landlord, not by an agent. So that's why this is a permitted payment. And then this last one, as I said, is problematic it's non-refundable. You can take a holding deposit, but not a non-refundable one. Okay. Okay, so that's the, you can do that with the tenant's consent. So you can't, an agent can't unilaterally do that. The tenant's consent, that's fine. Yeah, we were you doing it? <laughs> yeah, you've got to have tenants consent and ideally some sort of proof of that. Oh, they didn't hear that. Oh, sorry, the question was um, with a holding deposit or any deposit, specifically a holding deposit, is it okay to just set it off against the rent um, and say that we're effectively returning it just by setting it off? Um, and the answer to that is that that is permissible, but only with the tenant's consent. If we're doing it unilaterally, then that's not okay. Um, question nine of ten. If I have a contractual periodic tenancy for until 2014, that's the key bit, uh, but I haven't served an EPC or that's an energy performance certificate or a gas safety certificate, can I serve a section 31 notice or do I need to go through those two for serving one? You do. Um, no, you do not. I mean, I wouldn't advise against it. You might as well, you might as well, but it's not going to defeat your claim. The reason for that is that all these requirements, EPC, GSC, and the House Rev booklet only apply to tenancies granted on the 1st of October. Um, and then finally, is the government likely to abolish Section 21 before that landmark can give another seminar on this topic? <laughs> the online people are hoping for yes. Um, any thoughts? Any thoughts on whether it's likely to be abolished? Yeah, we'll probably do another seminar. All right, well, thanks very much. Thanks for playing with my quiz.
Mira, thank you very much indeed. I like the way there are more participants once you gave the answers, but there we are. People, on, people <laughs> online are people online are vindicated. Um, Yes, it does appear, doesn't it? The direction of travel in 1921 is one way. Um, but as, as was just observed, I ever heard, the question is whether or not there's any capacity for government to take any steps in this regard and abolish it. But it does seem like that will be a possibility and that more than in a hope, and maybe an expectation and hope that maybe the last seminar I've given on it at Landmarks. Miriam, well done, many thanks. Um, now a slight change of speed, our third uh, topic. Um, Brooke Lyne is going to address the question of claims against uh, trespassers. Um, she, Brooke, is a specialist property practitioner uh, with a broad experience of residential and commercial L&T matters. She is co-author of On Your Feet, uh, a practical guide to civil advocacy. I wasn't saying On Your Feet, to, to, to the audience in this room. On Your Feet, a practical guide to civil advocacy. So those of you that are considering um, uh, a bit of advocacy uh, in, the, uh, in, this, in this space will be well advised to read that. Uh, it's a civil advocacy book for junior practitioners, direct to the junior practitioners. Um, and in relation to uh, Brooke's recent experience, um, she has been involved in a number of possession claims against squatters, uh, one particularly um, uh, acting in relation to squatters underneath the uh, archways uh, of the uh, railway, um, I think in London. Uh, and also she has been um, involved in injunctions against um, what I think became known as urban explorers, uh, those that like to climb tall buildings uh, uh, without permission, um, seeking to break into, are those that were seeking to break into and scale tall buildings. Uh, and she's had um, some success against uh, restraining uh, those activities. And I think she's again off to the Supreme Court. Um, I think this time in December with Simon Allison, another in a case concerning the apportionment of service charges. So uh, a completely different field, but she is, um, very experienced in this area, and I look forward to what she has to say. Brooke. Thank you, James. Um, I don't have anything useful to say about my appearance. I look broadly the same as that photograph you want to see. Hair is slightly longer, otherwise, um, I'd like to think the same, maybe a few more lines. So, um, as always, barristers talk for too long, so I'm conscious that um, we'll be sat here for 55 minutes. And those at home have obviously been deliberately looking at their screens for 55 minutes and not on YouTube instead. Um, and I'm hoping the participants online are not suddenly going to keep dropping like flies, um, even if you are disappearing. Could you just leave your screen on for a while? So it looks like there's still lots of people listening to my talk, because it will make me feel better. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about trespass possession proceedings. Um, obviously, the focus of what you've heard so far has been entirely residential. And of course, trespass for stuff applies both across residential and commercial um, uh, premises. I'm going to talk about the, what, what I describe as the standard trespass at possession routes first, and then I'm going to very briefly talk about interim possession orders. It will be, I'm afraid, a whistle stop tour um, because I do an interim possession orders talk for two hours and I bore you to tears with it, but there is actually quite a lot there. So I'm going to go through it quite quickly, um, but obviously take this stuff away. And obviously, if you've got a trespass possession claim, you're going to need to look at it in a bit more depth. So we'll look at trespass and possession claims in the first instance, which court, the procedure, and then IPOs. I also don't have a really fun test for you guys, and I'm going to bore you to death with procedure. So if you're falling asleep, could you also make sure you keep your eyes open just so I don't get terrible stuff? Great. Right. Um, okay, what is a trespass and possession claim? So I should say from the outset, um, there isn't a special practice direction for trespass and possession claims, not standard ones anyway. Nonetheless, there is, realistically speaking, a different procedure if you're dealing with a trespass and possession claim. Okay. Before we get into that, though, there is an important distinction to be drawn between trespassers at common law and trespassers under the CPR and the process for evicting them under the CPR. Okay. Why does that matter? So we all know that trespassers under the common law are people either in occupation um, of land or premises without consent, okay, broadly speaking. Under the CPR, there is a specific definition that is a smaller category of trespasses. So it's up there on the screen. A possession claim against trespassers means a claim for the recovery of land, which the claimant alleges is occupied only by a person or persons who entered or remained on the land without the consent of the person who took possession of that land, 
but does not include a claim against a tenant or subtenant, whether his tenancy has been terminated or not. So crucially, if the person in occupation is a trespasser but formally had a tenancy, you can't use this process. If they were formerly a licensee, you can, but if they were formerly a tenant, you cannot use this process, okay? And if you do, you're probably gonna find either your claim is struck out or your first hearing is adjourned because the time limits are shorter and the court's going to say, well, you've had the advantage of using the, the more truncated procedure and as a consequence, the, the squatter should be given a bit more time, okay? Yeah, so formal licensee, yes, former tenant, no. Um, and crucially, it's, it is a quicker process. Um, the hearing is generally going to be listed more quickly and the period for service is shorter. So that's why if you are within the, the, the definition of trespassers under the CPR, you want to use it because you will get your hearing and you will get your um, order probably much faster than if you use the standard special process. And those of you in this room who are nodding at me, in the last year, possession proceedings, which formerly did get issued and, and get to a first hearing within eight weeks, are not, that is not happening anymore. And I had a case in Clarkwell and Shoreditch last week that was issued in February, and we had the first hearing last week. So, I mean, the delay is real. So if you've got a trespasser one and you fall within the provisions, use it. Okay, which court? The default is, of course, um, you go to the county court. And the position, um, is that you can actually issue your possession claim in any county court in the country. Um, and then what will happen if you've issued it in a county court, which is not the court that is local to the property, it will then get bounced to the court that is local to the property. So if you happen to practice in Yeovil, you could issue your claim in Yeovil, even though the property is actually in Liverpool. Why on earth you would do that, I do not know, because the reality is it will get stuck in the system, probably get lost in the back of someone's van and never make it to Liverpool. In theory, you can do it. I don't know why you would, but you can do it. Um, and you shouldn't receive any sanctions having done it that way, okay? Um, it will end up in the, the hearing centre that's local, so as far as I see it, why would we just issue in the local? Um, you can also, of course, issue a possession claim in the High Court, um, but the reality is you should only do so in pretty exceptional circumstances. And I've put on the slides um, practice direction 55A. And if you are contemplating issuing, issuing in the High Court, you really must have a look at the practice direction. And you will need to serve a certificate explaining why you have issued the claim in the High Court rather than in the County Court. And the practice direction, as you can see, says that it may be appropriate to issue in the High Court if there are, for example, complicated disputes of fact. In reality, trespasser claims very rarely involve complicated disputes of fact. So normally that's not going to apply. Secondly, um, if there are points of law of general importance, again, trespasser possession claims very rarely have complex arguments of law to be made. So again, I find it very unlikely, generally speaking, that that will apply. The third is where actually sometimes a claim might justifiably be issued in the High Court. And that's where trespasser the claim is against trespassers and there is a substantial risk of public disturbance or of serious harm to persons or property that properly require immediate determination. Now, on the one hand, quite a lot of the squatter claims I've ever done might be arguably a situation where there was a risk of violence or a risk of damage to property. The threshold of the High Court is higher than that just general level of the possibility of someone being antisocial. You need something more. So the case that James was referring to where it was about arches in London, those arches were underneath um, a very important part of uh, the national highway, uh, the national railway network. And squatters had barricaded themselves into the archways, were having raids and lighting fires under the archways. And that particular archway was one of the most important access points for access to the railway in the event of signalling problems or some kind of problem on the railway if the train was stuck, that kind of thing. So that was the type of case where the actual risk of a fire in the archway was really quite serious. And that was a case that justified going to the High Court. Unless you've got something exceptional like that, 
err on the side of caution, go to the county court, um, write to the county court in your covering letter and say, look, this is really urgent, we're going to be hearing ASAP because there's a risk of something. But in reality, if you're not sure, err on the side of caution, you can go to the county court. The bottom one, um, if the property value, um, if the value of the property or the amount of any financial claim, um, that might be relevant. In reality, it rarely is. Okay, so the property happens to be in a really nice part of West London. So what? Um, I, I don't think in general they're going to care um, unless you can point to something that justifiably means that it really ought to be in high court. Um, what's the consequence? If you go to the wrong court, you might be struck out. Or if you're lucky, it will be transferred to the county court. But again, it's going to be transferred to the local hearing centre, probably get lost, and you're not going to be able to call anybody because nobody answers the phone at the county court. So err on the side of caution. Um, don't issue in the high court unless you really, really can justify it. And the reality is, if you issue wrongly in the, in the high court, it's going to re result in delays, but it's also probably going to result in other cost consequences because the costs associated with the wrong issue will inevitably not be recoverable. Um, um, small point, um, if you are issuing a trespass or claim and you don't know the names of at least one person in occupation, then you need to issue against persons unknown. Generally speaking, if it is a pure squatter claim, you'll find you might not know anyone's name and you just issue against persons unknown. Okay, time. So in a possession claim against trespassers, there's special um, signs for service of the uh, claim form to the claim and any witness statement. So if you're dealing with residential property, not less than five days before the hearing. And if you're dealing with other land, so commercial premises or open land, then not less than two days before the hearing. Note that that provides that it must be the claim form, particular the claim and any witness statements. The usual course for ordinary possession claims is you serve your witness statement maybe a week before the actual hearing, but separate to the claim form. For a trespasser claim, it all needs to happen at once. So make sure at the point of issue, you've got your witness statement, you've got everything ready, and you can serve it all in one go. Okay, method of service. And this is something that frequently goes wrong, unfortunately. Um, and because the reality when you're dealing with a trespass or possession claim is that there are few defences available. The judge, judge will be a stickler for procedure. So if you've got it wrong, probably end up with an adjournment, even though there's no substantive defence that could possibly be on. For service, um, there's two options. Firstly, attaching copies of the claim form, pictures, and witness statements to the main door or rather some other part of the land so that they are clearly visible. If it is residential commercial premises, main door out front. I also suggest if there's a back door, one on the back door as well. Notably, this first option is an and. So not only the front door and probably the back door, but also if practicable, inserting copies of the document in a sealed transparent envelope addressed to the occupier and through the left box. I had a case recently where the and hadn't properly been appreciated. And in fact, there was a left box and it hadn't been used. There was posting of the, the documents in the front and back of the, of the premises, but they hadn't put them through the left box. So note that and. If it's possible, put them through a left box, put them through a left box. Obviously, option one is primarily dealing with actual premises. Option two, about placing stakes in the land, is generally targeted at open land, right? And when it's open land, placing stakes in the land and then so that they're clearly visible and then attaching copies of the document, document to the field transport, transparent envelope to the rest of the files. Sounds obvious. It goes wrong quite a lot. Um, I would strongly urge you, if you are dealing with a trespass possession claim, to instruct process servers. The majority of problems come up when the client decides they want to do service themselves because they get it wrong. Instruct a process server who has experience of serving trespassers and they should know what they're doing. I also suggest that you don't file just a normal certificate of service, that you actually get them to prepare a short written statement explaining what they did, because you need to comply with these requirements and you need to satisfy the court that you have. So the certificate of service the, the form doesn't lend itself to being able to prove that. Also, we live in a technological age. Photographs. Photographs of everything. 
okay, attached to their witness statement, um, you know, then, then you can't have a spotter turn up and say, well, actually, I've not seen any notice, I've got no idea about this hearing. Um, because if the judge can see a photograph where clearly it was attached in four different places to the building and one was put through the left box, the judge is going to say, well, I'm sorry, you clearly were, you know, clearly noticed this. Uh, the procedure, this is all relatively boring. Claim form, six of claim in the N121 form, the particular form to use. Um, the six of claim, you can state the claim is interest in the land on the basis of the right to claim possession. Um, James mentioned earlier, the copy entries attached to your six of claim, pretty important. Um, the other thing to say is, and it often doesn't arise because you might not worry about it, there isn't provision in the standard of claim for mean profits. So if a person is a trespasser, you are entitled to mean profits for the period of their trespass. In reality, most squatter claims might not be bothered about recovering it because you might never find out their names and have no realistic prospect of getting any money from them. If, however, you're dealing with a former licensee, for example, who was formerly paying a licensee for occupation, you might decide, well, actually, we are going to charge mean profits if so, you need to amend the N121. What I normally do is I put it into Acrobat, I turn it into a, a, you know, a, a PDF that can be amended, and I just add it in. Sometimes, if it is sufficiently complicated, perhaps the title is complicated, you might decide actually you know, what you're going to put in addition to six of claim in addition to the N121. Rarely is that necessary, um, but if for some reason there is some complexity to it, um, then you might need to do it. The other thing to say, and it's not a requirement, but it's generally helpful, is if there's some complexity to the particular premises or the land about precisely which part you're seeking possession of, make sure you've got a clear plan and please ensure that it's a clear plan that is actually in colour in the court copy. The amount of times it's, oh well, coloured in blue on that plan, but the court's got a, a black and white version and can't see it. Um, so that's an important Defendant doesn't need to actually file a defence. They can just rock up and say what they like. It's always fun. Will anyone attend? It's always a game of Russian roulette when you get to a possession hearing against the Scottish. And actually, um, I've been doing this job five or six years. And for the first, probably the first three years of practice, despite having done hundreds of, hundreds of trespass possession claims, I had yet to have a squatter actually attend a trespass possession hearing. Until about 18 months ago, when I said to one of my sisters, Oh, don't worry, no one ever attends this hearing. You betcha. <laughs> and at that hearing, um, some people turned up, and these people had also been um, defrauded by another squatter who told that they could have a license for premises and this individual didn't know um, had disappeared. So um, that would teach me occasionally someone turns up and you just have to kind of go with it on that case. Um, if that happens, then you are back to the standard situation of a normal possession claim, which is where the court will consider, is this claim genuinely disputed on grounds that appear to be substantial? If it is, the court will probably then adjourn you off and your client will be very unimpressed. The other thing to say is that the, order, the usual order when it is a trespasser claim is that the, the immediate possession should be given. And there's a, an old case called the sale of persons unknown to that effect. Sometimes a judge might say, oh, well, don't you think you might want to give them a bit more time? Obviously, if your client is amenable to that, um, you can agree a longer period um, for possession. But the reality is, is getting a warrant takes a bit of time these days anyway, so I suspect most clients wouldn't be able to do that. Briefly on costs, make a decision about whether you're going to bother to do a cost schedule. Um, most of the time, if you're dealing with people you do not know, the time spent doing a cost schedule really won't be worth it. Um, if someone does then turn up, it's probably worth instructing counsel to just seek their own brief fee um, rather than you know, time, incurring time of you preparing a cost schedule in, the, in the circumstances where it's very unlikely. One that someone will turn up, turn up again and be then named as someone to be a subject to um, a cost order, but then two, are they actually going to be any good for the money either? So um, they're not anyway. Okay, interim possession orders. Let's get through the chart. Okay, this is an alternative route to get possession. It's quick and it has the threat of 
um, criminal sanction if not complied with. It's an entirely separate process with a weird kind of hybrid initial procedure that doesn't make a great deal of sense, but we just go with it. They are only available in very prescribed situations. If you don't meet these requirements, then you need to use the other trespasser standard possession process. IPOs are only available when you are recovering uh, possession of premises, not open land. They can only be used for big squatters who enters the land without the consent of the owner. So again, you can't, you can't do this against someone who either entered as um, a licensee or, or as a tenant. There is also this special 28 day deadline between the date of the landlord's knowledge and the claim being issued. And if you've got a client who unfortunately has an agent that just sat on their hands for a few weeks, you might have already missed both. And that is strict. There isn't any scope to extend. If it's 28 days, if you've missed, missed the 28 days, we'll have to use you. The applicant must also have been the owner or lessee of the land throughout the period of occupation by the squatters. It sounds like an odd thing to say, but if, for example, your client happens to purchase the land halfway through the squatters being there, or a few days after the squatters arrive, then again, you can't use this route. If you like, the process is designed to be the bare bones and to ensure that the tenant is going to have the most limited possible way to free the fence. So the most simple types of cases um, is where an ICO might be available. Um, and the applicant must have an immediate right to possession. So it, you can't have a superior landlord who doesn't have an immediate right to possession um, seeking a um, ICO. Who issued in the cash court? You need your claim form, application notice, and 130, which is a prescribed notice application notice, which has all of the information you need, so just use it. Um, and then you need your written evidence of support, the same as the standard trespasser possession claim, the witness statement has to go in at the outset. So you need to have all your ducks in a row at the very beginning. The witness statement needs to cover all of the stuff that I've just discussed. So it needs to cover all of those requirements in sort of a tick box and fashion. Crucially, and this comes up so often, almost every ICO I've ever done, this is not done right, the witness statement has to come from the claimant personally, if the claimant is individual, or by a duly authorised officer if it's a claimant company. A duly authorised officer, it seems to me, is either the company secretary or a director, which if you're dealing with a significant corporate landlord, can be quite tricky. The amount of times I've seen the solicitor sign a witness statement, or the agent of the agent of the agent of the landlord sign a witness statement, that is not compliant. And you might finally get adjourned because it's not been done properly. So that's really important. Um, you could also issue these against persons unknown. They're usually, and they should be listed at the point of issue. This normally is the case that's actually attending court and getting an issue there and then. Um, and then there's this the whole process in terms of service. So you have to serve within 24 hours of the issue of the claim and application being issued. Um, the court should write the time of issue on, on the application form and on the claim form. So you know to the, to the minute that you've got 24 hours. Um, you, you need to serve claim forms, application notice, evidence, and a blank with the statement form in case squatters decide they want to write something on it. You're also under the rule supposed to file a certificate of service before the hearing. In reality, we all know that documents that are filed before the hearing rarely reach the judge. So anybody attending the hearing, you bring copies anyway, because um, you do your due diligence in serving it and filing it, and it won't actually be the whole part. Then there's the hearing. This is the interim hearing. Um, any defendant who, um, who turns up to court is entitled to participate, even if they've not filed a witness statement. And the court will ordinarily grant you the IPO if you meet the requirements and the proper service procedure has been followed. Um, the prescribed form also makes provision for the payment to provide undertaking. Pretty standard undertaking. Um, they need to be in the proper form in order for the court to make an IPO. If you get your IPO, great. At that hearing, the court will generally list the substantive possession hearing. It will normally be a couple of weeks later. Great, you've got your IPO and now you need to serve. 
it must be served within 48 hours being sealed. Again, really quite a tight time period. I strongly suggest that you get a process server to attend court at the time of the IPO hearing so that they can wait at court, collect the order, go and do it there and then. If you wait for the court, um, one, to produce your order, um, and then for someone to come back later, you'll often find that 48 hours has long since disappeared. So it needs to be served within 48 hours to be sealed. And again, the time at which the order was granted should be written on the face of the order on the document. If the plotter fails to leave the premises within 24 hours of service, then he or she commits an offence. In reality, the police are very unlikely to do anything about it, but nonetheless, the risk of the sanction often means that the squatters will disappear. If that person returns within a year, uh, to the property within a year, they also commit an offence, which is again helpful. If your client thinks, actually we're dealing with the same squatters over and over again, having that threat of potential criminal sanction for a year can be an incentive to go to an IPO. And it's also for an offence for anyone else to trespass at the premises where there's an IPO in court. So actually it protects you against someone else deciding to, to drop in after your current trespass is left. Um, obviously the, the exception to that is where a copy of the order hasn't actually been fixed to the premises or where it's been taken off. Crucially, if you don't serve within the 48 hours, then you won't, then, then the trespass won't be taken. The timing here is really important. Then there's another hearing, and the next hearing is essentially the same as a standard possession hearing. Okay, the judge can make the exact same orders it would in the usual way. Look at service in advance, waste of time, but you need to do it, turn up with it in any event, and then the interim possession order will expire at that hearing. And then the court can decide, right, I'm going to now make a final possession order. I'm going to dismiss the claim or give directions for this to be dealt with in, in the usual way um, if someone has decided to defend the claim. Um, or in worst case scenario, if the landlord's done something terrible, the court could even enforce the undertaking. Okay, that was super fast. Um, we're now, I think, going to move on to the Q&A session. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much indeed. That was in incredibly clear and helpful. Um, I don't know about you, but when I'm asked to advise on a trespass claim initially, one of the tough ones is a client wants an order, but often the better way of looking uh, at addressing it is to see whether the police will get themselves involved or whether you can persuade the enforcement officers that they should um, take action without having to go down the possession route. Um, particularly in the context of travellers. I don't know how many of you have to deal with travellers, but um, the police now have new powers in relation to encampments, which obviously includes um, uh, land taken uh, by travellers. And uh, in my recent experience, the police actually have been prepared to use the powers to persuade uh, travellers to move on uh, under threat of imprisonment or impounding of vehicles. So that might be a um, better, can be a better and quicker route out. The enforcement officers, in my experience, tend to like to, to be enforcing with the benefit of a court order. Although I'm afraid I don't actually, I, I, having asked them, I still don't really know why it is there's any difference between exercising your common law rights by instructing an enforcement officer to take possession or doing so once you've got an order. But I suppose it might be something to do with the legality of the use of force. Um, so in a difficult, a squatted case, it may be thought better if you can't get police involved to um, get an order and then get the enforcement officers to enforce. The reason I say that is going to the, the, the points that um, Brooke raised about county court or high court. Plainly, the county court is very slow um, to issue um, uh, claims um, uh, and more importantly, to get a hearing. And eight weeks is not uh, unusual, um, even in a trespasser claim. So you want to go after the high court and the High Court does have both the QB and the Chancery Division um, a triage system where the masters will look at a will look at a claim and determine at an early stage whether or not they believe it's appropriate to have it in the uh, in the High Court based upon the sorts of criteria that Brooke and outlined. So you may not face a strike out. What you may face, however, is the position where the master says it's not suitable for High Court work, as happened in a recent uh, a more recent case or a less recent case rather that I had to do with uh, occupants of a building on the uh, 
Gosling Road in Clerkenwell, and it got transferred off to the county court. And it did get a bit lost in the system, but eventually it made its way to um, one of the judges at Central London, and then a hearing was arranged pretty quickly. So maybe the right thing to do is to write to the High Court, um, get the master to triage it, and if he refuses to accept it as High Court business, uh, and make an order for short service, which is what the masters um, are, are won't do. The alternative is that you get them to transfer it very quickly off to central London, attention of um, one of the judges there who will hopefully will be able to um, organise a hearing. But it is problematical. And although, as I say, the jurisdiction is, um, as Brooke identified, the standard jurisdiction is the county court, it's really not very, um, it, it isn't helpful, certainly not helpful in my experience to our clients. So one has to just navigate around um, the obstacles that are put in our way in that, in that respect. And as I say, the police or the bailiffs might uh, often are can be a better way forward right that's my little penny worth we've got some questions i think uh, online before we deal with those um, does anybody have any questions in the room arising from the um very interesting presentations we listened to this evening yes um brooke were you were saying about you had the case under the bridge and if they had to leave a stake in the ground and say it was concrete or something, what would you what would the process that would do that so I think in that instance, there were places we could place the um, documents. So as you know, walls and things that we place on outside. Um, but also, I think we ended up knocking on doors, peering in and saying, you know, can you take this and someone take it? So um, unless you're dealing with sort of agricultural land or open land, to be honest, most of the time you'll find there's some way you can place it or yeah. Yes, again, in regards to the trespassers. Um, so with the police involvement that James is mentioning, how many residential properties, because it's been made a criminal offence to squat residential properties, are still coming up? I assumed it was only commercial premises that were coming up. Um, well, from my experience, what happens frequently, and these are happening frequently, in circumstances where someone um, purports to be a licensing or tenant residential premises, and then then give someone else a license, and actually no one's got any license. I mean, I still think they're quite they're residential, but there certainly is residential property still going on. And just the reality is, is the police are not interested, um, and so although it is intense to spot in residential premises, in reality there's no point. Does so anybody else have a question in the room before we turn to the online questions? People have been very busy online. Thank you very much indeed. First question in relation to residential property claims is instead a requirement to send in a COVID 19 impact notice when no. commencing your claim for possession? Well, yep. Most but no <laughs> <laughs> Steve. Um, what action should you take if trespassers have vacated a few days before your possession hearing? So you've served your possession proceedings, but um, uh, the, the squatters leave before you've had your hearing. That is an excellent question, and it happens all of the time. Um, I think, strictly speaking, if you have definitive evidence that the trespassers have gone, the court ought not to be granting your possession order. If, however, you suspect they have gone, then I think you probably are still entitled to your possession order. Um, that happens a lot, and frequently um, clients don't think about the fact that actually now the relief that I'm seeking, I already have. So I had a case recently where my client had already gone in, changed the locks, and was in occupation, um, and still wanted a possession order. And I was just thinking, well, you've got possession. Why would you want the order? Why would you want to pay me to attend, frankly? Um, so yeah, I think you need to, you need to decide how, how how definitive um, it is that they've gone, but if they have gone, probably you just invite the court to dismiss your claims. Yes, I mean, I think there's always a concern, isn't there, that they're going to they're going to come back or they haven't really left, or you can if you can provide evidence they may have only temporarily located, and that, that can be grounds for possession order. And or and or if they've left items behind them, that plainly they also haven't given you vacant possession. So I suppose you could get an order in that space circumstances, but again. Brooke says it's kind of pointless getting a possession order in relation to barrels of oil or empty barrels being left behind, wherever it might be an open, open land. But um, no, you're right, it does happen. That was a good question. 
um, this is not about this one about interim possession orders. Uh, is an interim possession order worthwhile given the likely extended time period until a final possession hearing? I was under the impression that uh, they are only worthwhile if the police will agree to take action if an IPO is obtained. And often the police do not have the resources or willingness to assist. So yes, that's about the sanction that you can that, 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 that follows upon failure to comply with the IPO. Um, so I agree that police are unlikely to assist generally. Um, and if you could get them to help, that's clearly a reason to um, apply for an IPO. The only thing I'm not sure I agree with there is that the timing for the return date for the possession hearing. My experience is that the courts tend to see IPOs as a sort of fast track. Um, and you tend to find that even the return date for the possession hearing is listed much faster than it would be under a normal possession route. So but if you meet the requirements, it's certainly worth thinking about. And during COVID, IPOs were exempt from the um, moratorium. So I use them quite a lot, but certainly my clients have used them quite a lot then. Um, and they can be useful, but as you say, there are hurdles to jump into. A question about the what are the consequences of the inappropriate use of part of the private solution to as established in that license? Um, the most likely thing that's going to happen is an adjournment because the court's going to say, Well, look, you've only given two or five days notice to um, uh, the, the defendant to attend this hearing, so we need to give them a longer period that's required under the usual route. Um, there is a possibility they could strike you out. You've not complied. You've not used the right procedure. Um, you could be struck out. I think the more likely our, our answer is that you'll be adjourned and you'll have to come back in six weeks, eight weeks, whenever the court can find you um, another hearing date. Um, and then, good. Uh, big about the housing uh, aspect. This is early one. Um, grounding. What does the house then required? Uh, so I think the question there relates to whether or not you can rely on grounding if uh, you fall outside of the four periods that have been uh, explicitly provided for within that. So that's, I think, weekly, um, monthly, quarterly, or annually. And, and obviously, I've had this come up as well in tenancies that I've been dealing with where rent is actually payable uh, by annually or half yearly. Uh, and I think we may even have a different view in this panel as to what, what that means. I think if I'm acting for a tenant, my, my view would be, uh, what you're dealing with is very, very serious consequences of someone losing their home. The statute is very strict about the periods with which, uh, on which you can rely on ground eight. The landlord actually doesn't have very much prejudice because they can still rely on other, on 10 and 11, where you've got serious rent arrears and, and, uh, and the tenants have been drafted in the way they can no longer rely on that ground. I mean, that's one view. Uh, I, I haven't been able to find any direct authority on this point, actually. And I think there's an alter the alternative view if you're acting for, I'm acting for a landlord, is they will maybe take a more purposive approach to that section and you say look, the, the purpose of this is to get is to deal with issues of serious rent arrears so i think i had a case where the we were dealing with, with um two years of the arrears um and the question then is well someone one might be able to argue because this clearly falls within what ground is really uh, that we should be capturing so we should be allowed to rely on that but i, I think there's there's alternative views there as to what happens Sorry, there were a number of questions about service and proof of service. Um, there was one specifically about Section 21 notices. Um, what do you think about what's the safest way of addressing the question of service of, of notices? Um, because sometimes you can argue that um, you can provide a witness evidence of simply the proof of uh, postage of, of, a, of a notice. Um, but what sort of evidence, evidence do you advise is necessary in relation to service? I would say that the state is best with as much um, documentary evidence of citizens as possible. Um, the certificate of service is not a magic bullet that people can hit. It's not just a given certificate of service for the judge and that's it, you win on the service point. Um, there's also a particular problem with certificates of service points that um, I have had judges before take issue with solicitors <coughs> signing them when the solicitors haven't done the service. So the client does the service, for example, the client puts the notice in the post, the agent, the state agent puts the notice in the post, and then the solicitor is there saying it's signed. Judges sometimes take issue with that. Um, I don't think certificate of service is sort of magic that people think it is, so I would say just a very detailed um, witness statement. It's difficult to know whether a service point is important or not, and so how long to go with the service. Um, 
I would sort of start with a light touch in a whip stick, then if it really becomes an issue, um, then you might need to have more detailed evidence. But the, I guess the important point is when you're serving, make sure you've got that documentary evidence later on. So if you're putting it in the post, make sure you've got something to prove you've done that. Uh, a couple more, because I know we're running over time, um, but there's some quite good, good ones in here. Um, I think you've answered this, Miriam. If the contract is a fixed term tenancy, it is not expired, is a break clause required to be able to serve a Section 21 notice? I think you said yes to that, didn't you? You do need to exercise the break clause. There is case law suggesting that a Section 21 notice, if it's expressed clearly enough, could sort of act as a dual purpose, both in Section 21 and it's exercising the break clause. Um, if you can, I would sort of serve a separate one. But if you need to fall back on the Section 21 notice, then there is that case that would help you. Um, have you had experience with a tenant refusing to accept the return of the deposit? If so, is if the landlord can show they've done all that is possible to return the deposit, make it available to the tenant, would that be sufficient to negate any issues with serving a Section 21 notice? I think that is quite a common issue and it's a big problem because if what you've got to do to serve Section 21 is return the deposit and the tenant's not allowing you to do that, then you are sort of rather stuck. I don't know of any case law suggesting that if you do the best you can, then that will be sufficient. Um, but if, if you have no other options, uh, then I would certainly suggest that do what you can to return it, make that, you know, make that evidentially clear, um, and then serve your Section 21 notice afterwards. I don't know if you've got any views on that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I would probably, yeah, exactly. I mean, I would give them a check, I'd send them a check think of that situation. I mean the best thing would be to set yourself up in a way at the beginning of the tenancy, um, you know, get their bank details so yeah. that you can be voluntary within the money, whatever you want. <laughs> um, so I think so, sort of preempt that situation. Um, is there not an argument that so the deposit, if it's being held in a deposit protection scheme, which it should be, if that's not being released and it can't be released without the tenant's authority, then that original deposit is not being returned. So even if you give them cash or check, it's a really technical point, but we've had someone take the argument with us before. It had to be the original deposit that, that was returned. Like it's not the actual pot of money, it's just going to take the deposit. I think that's rubbish. I think that's a rubbish point. It's taken against you, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was, we didn't raise it. We had a very tenant sympathetic judge who just dismissed it and we did everything all over again. And Managed to get it sorted with the tenancy deposit scheme to get it returned, but so what yeah. was being suggested that you would have to actually get the same <laughs> yeah. pounds out? And yeah, I think that's bad. I think oh, it went God. back to like some historic case where like a five pound note it had to be the original five pound note that was returned, otherwise it was theft or some very basic. <laughs> I think it's things that yeah. I think it's clever, well, it's clever, it's a bit rough. Yeah. <laughs> okay, glad to know that I'm not alone in that. Well, I'm sorry for going over time. Thank you very much indeed, um, for your attention and indeed for coming uh, or, or for signing up online and staying with us until 20 to 7. Many thank you. Um, many thanks to the, the panellists who provided, I hope, you think was a um, uh, revealing and insightful uh, summary of some of the principles that um, we need to be concerned with in what is a difficult and very technical area. Um, and I think there are now going to be um, some drinks and some refreshments if you're able to stay. Please don't feel you have to, but if you can, it'd be very nice if you did. Thank you very much indeed.